Hey, 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 everybody. It's Thursday, Thursday time. How's we all doing? Okay, you can hear me, right? Come on, give me some thumbs up. Give me the yeses, give me the noes. We got it, we're all good. All right, so let's do this once again. It is a stay in place. So we're gonna do a tasting in place on a Thursday, Thursday here at Brutico and let's have some fun. It's Sangiovese night. Uh, I've been looking forward to this night for a while. I'll be honest with you. Um, I love our Sangiovese. Sangiovese is one of my favorite varietals. Uh, I have to be honest. Um, I fell in love with it when I was in Italy uh, drinking Super Tuscans. And um, I don't remember that night, but I heard I had a great time. Um, but anyway, I digress. So uh, I was practicing for a stay in place, right? Okay. So we had, uh, me and my wife, uh, we honeymooned in Italy. Um, me and Bev had a great time and tasted a lot of great Sangiovese in a Tuscany region. So it was a lot of fun. So with me as always is Super Director Producer Zoom aficionado, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Hello. Hey, we got Karen. Karen's here tonight. Say hi, Karen. Hi. All right. And David's with us as always. Hey, David. Oh, and we have a special guest from the Yuma Penitentiary tonight, all the way. Um, say hi, Stephen Brudico. Hello, Stephen Brudico. There you go. Finally, a comedian shows up. They let me out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so it's been a really good week here at Brudico. We've all been uh, having some fun and uh, getting together, tasting some wines. So um, I hope you guys love those videos. Uh, Lynn, great job. That was, uh, I love how showing everybody how we're doing the thinning, um, watching the, the, the ladies go through and do that and tucking and putting the wires up and kind of show you what we're doing right now. Um, it's a very busy time in the vineyard. Probably, I would say the second busiest next to harvest uh, is this time of year because what we do now will improve the quality of the grapes and the wines that we're going to actually pick um, later this uh, summer and fall. So uh, it's very important that we're out there doing this, thinning these out, getting all that energy and all the good karma from the soil coming up into those and making better wine by making better grapes. So that's what we're doing right now. So it's a lot of fun. As always, Nui says hi. She had a great time out there running around. She was a little pissed at me, though, because it was a short run and she had to go home. But anyway, so... Uh, but it's always fun to be out in the vineyard and running around and taking a look at the vines. Um, I'll have to tell you, I'm a little excited about what I saw in the Sangiovese uh, just this last week. It's really looking nice. It's looking really healthy. The bunches look really good. And when I was showing you those nice full bunches that are going to be kind of firming up a little bit more, um, they look a little bit better than they did last year. So um, it's okay, Steve. We have more. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> He was, he was crying. We had to stop. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Yes. yes, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, so, hey, guys, um, always a lot of fun uh, doing these and having a good time. Sangiovese, uh, the number one planted grape in Italy. It is actually grown all over Italy, but is most famous from the Tuscan region. Um, so, um, you know, everybody knows Chianti Classico, Brunello is 100% Sangiovese. Um, Cal Italia's was a big thing for quite a while, but they kind of fell on the wayside because people were trying to make Sangiovese like they made their Cabernet. They, they weren't really adhering to what the grape really was. So they became super acidic, um, not a lot of fruit, um, and they lost some of their body is what I remember from a lot of those. So what we found is that, you know, if you grow them right and do a couple things, it, it works really well. Um, so um, this is our 2015 Sangiovese. So our Sangiovese, um, we have a couple different clones. So Sangiovese comes in two classes. It comes in Grosso and Piccolo. And one basically means a large bunch and one means smaller bunches. That's really the difference in them. Grosso is the main ones you see in Montepulciano and in Brunellos and so forth. That's the, the main uh, clones. Um, the Piccolos are special, they're a specialty clone. Um, so they give you a different flavor and they're for different areas also. Uh, they grow differently, so, um, but uh, they still have their, uh, their nuances. Um, where I used to work, we actually had what's called BB12, which was a small size clone, uh, which was really unique and different completely to what the Grosso's were. But the Grosso's usually have a little bit bigger, richer body um, uh, to them, um, maybe a little bit earthiness, more earthiness to them, um, I think, too. So 
let's dig into some wine. We've talked way too long. We made you wait, I know, for almost 15 minutes before I started tasting. And I know none of you have had any yet, so, you know, we better get going. Anyway, all right. You know, um, so the thing about our Sangiovese is I try to be with all of our varietals as respectful to where they're grown here and what they give me out in the vineyard. So when you first get this wine, I get that beautiful strawberry. I really get that. And that's Sangiovese, it's strawberry. You pick Sangiovese on a riper side because otherwise you don't get that strawberry. And um, I have to admit, earlier on, there was a lot more of um, a darker fruit, not quite, maybe like a dark cherry, plummy type of thing. But now it's more that, that blueberry notes coming through, but it's that real kind of that strawberry, blueberry combination with a little bit of dark fruit. And then it's got, um, there's a spice in this wine um, in the nose. And it's got like a, a cinnamon, but like a sweeter cinnamon. And um, I was banging my head earlier against the wall trying to remember what that spice was. And Kevin was laughing at me. But, you know, that's what happens when you're a winemaker and you just can't remember anything. Um, but it reminded me kind of like a, 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 a cinnamon stick, but with a little brown sugar. It just had that kind of tone. And uh, I really enjoyed that. That was great. And almost a little bit of a, a pepperiness, spicy pepper in the background. Maybe a little bit like a red flake. Not a lot, but it's just a hint in the back end. So that Sanchevese does give you a little bit of spice. It can do, it can do that. What I love about Sangiovese is the entry. I love how it's so rich, light, and bright at the same time. I love how it comes in. You get that hit of fruit. You get that lushness coming through. And then you get that brightness of the acidity right behind that. You can see why this wine is just loves Italian style food. It loves the food of Tuscany. It loves that tomato based uh, dish. Um, this would go really good with like a good risotto. And if I find one, I'll let you guys know. Um, but wood fired pizzas, the argument here is always about risotto, but that's a whole other thing. You know, like a marguerite pizza, something as simple as a marguerite pizza with this wine would be excellent because the brightness of that basil and the lushness of that mozzarella, you know, and then that red sauce with a little spice in it. You can just, you can see all that kind of rolling across your palate right now while you taste this. So that's what I'm saying. So it really wants that. This is that Italian wine that wants Italian fare. There's nothing, nothing different about that. Then when you get to that mid palate, that acid really kind of pops up a little bit bigger, but then it rolls back off again. The barrel influence on this wine, there's a little oak, not a lot on this vintage. Um, in the upcoming vintages, you're gonna see a little bit more oak influence and it's gonna make it a little bit bigger and bolder in the, in the finish, but it's still there. You kind of get a hint of fruit and you get a nice little spice on the back end. So it kind of rolls through. So you can see this wrapping itself around uh, a, a great bowl of uh, bolognese or, you know, or just a nice bowl of pasta. I could, I'd eat this with linguine and clams, you kidding me? Um, but this is the kind of wine that I really love every day. This is more of my everyday red wine because it's not super heavy to where if it's hot, it's going to bother me too much. It actually tastes really good, a little chilled. Um, but just sitting in the backyard and enjoying this with some crackers and cheese, you know, and the one you love, pfft, I tell you, it, it's, that's Italy right there. And that's what it should be. And that's what wine should be all about, is having that kind of fun and respect with it. The, um, the one thing I said, we, we don't use a lot of oak um, on our uh, Sangiovese because I don't want to overpower that fruit in that mid palate. So the oak regime is pretty light, maybe 10 to 12. We've got it up to about 15, 16% now. But in the past with this wine, this is that Allegro barrel is the reason I, it, uh, I was showing you in, that, in the video is because it's a low impact, but it gives you that boldness. It gives you that, that silky feeling right in the beginning. That's that Allegro barrel that does that for you. And it kind of rolls it on through. So uh, it's, uh, it's really, um, it's paying homage to the grape and the winemaking style by not over oaking it and using what oak we have too far and overtake the wine. Now, 
like um, the vintage that we were just looking at, uh, the 2020, looking at those grapes, look at those vines and the health of those vines, as long as we don't get a real weird summer, I could see a little bit more oak for that wine because it's going to be a bigger, bolder wine and it's going to want a little bit more oak to add a couple more nuances. Um, we've been playing with a little bit of American oak, those American oak barrels that I showed you again, that's the reason why I showed you that barrel. Um, and the fusion barrel is another reason. Um, it, those barrels are actually making a great impact on overpowering the wine and helping push that spice level a little bit more. Um, so, you know, this is the main component usually of Quadriga. We only bottle a small amount of this, 200 cases, 250 cases a year maybe at the most. So uh, um, it's a great wine. It's, you know, you give Chris a call right now because Chris wants to sell you some Sangiovese, so make sure you start calling Chris. Uh, but uh, I'm going to just drink. That's fine. Uh, so out there thinning, watching us thin and do what we're doing there, that's what helps promote uh, and getting those flavor profiles that we look for. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's one of those years that you got to get out there early, get it done. So uh, who's got some questions, or comments? It's like everybody's like silent we're tonight. Talking about risotto. That's the problem. We're all, everybody's talking about risotto. Is that what it is? Yeah, and cinnamon? Risotto and cinnamon, yeah. is that what we're talking about? Okay. Said cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> he said it three times, actually. Yeah. I think everyone's just enjoying the wine so much. Yeah. Hey, just keep drinking. You know, we'll make more. That's not a problem. That's a good question. Uh, what is your dog's name again? Nui. And what does that mean? It is Hawaiian for man-eating shark. It is N-U-H-I-U, -U, and Bev will correct me. <laughs> uh, why are some of the barrels painted red and others not because some people are sloppy when they're racking and some aren't um i mean it's it's true you actually a lot of times that's why in france and the big chateaus and everything they actually paint the outside of their barrel red with a wine or a food grade red stain so that way when you're topping and doing the, and doing wine work it doesn't show, so it looks like it's a natural thing. But that's just from us topping and, and working the barrels. And when you pull the barrel wand out, it kind of drips a little bit on top of the barrel. And over the years, it gets darker and darker. Um, so Luke's asking about when you put a wine in a new barrel to see, you know, what you get from that barrel. If you don't like the result, what do you do with that uh, the rest of the wine? Um, a lot of times by using a barrel... Well, let's, let's back up here. When I experiment with the barrel, I experiment on Cabernet. I always put a new barrel that I've never used before, most times on Cabernet or Zinfandel. And by, how, and, and by what that barrel does with that wine, um, I can tell what it's going to do with one of our other wines. Um, so usually I'm pretty sure what's going to happen uh, prior to that. And a lot of times I will work with the cooper themselves about the barrel and what I want to use it for and how I want to use it and take their recommendations into consideration also. And then by tasting the wine, if by some chance I put the wine in there and it doesn't quite work out, we make a note of it and we won't use that barrel for that style again. Um, but it might have been just that vintage. Like I said, I think this vintage is looking pretty good uh, for the Sangiovese. So I think we can put a little bit different oak on it, a little bit more bolder oak. But it depends on how it's tasting to me during fermentation, whether I change that around or anything. If it doesn't make the cut, usually you can hide it with the rest of the blend. It doesn't make that big of a difference um, because it might be just that one barrel out of 50. So um, it's not that flavor profile is not going to overpower it too much. But, you know, because I usually only use one barrel um, to test it on a lot. I don't use like, you know, I'll put 10 of them in there so it ruins the whole lot. So that's kind of how we work it. Is there, I have a question about that. So when you, maybe you don't like it for cab, but what is a signal that you might think it'd be good for a different varietal? Um, when I taste it, just to see how it changes the cab, we kind of know our cabs. I know our cabs and our Zinfandel a little bit better than the rest of our varieties sometimes because they react pretty, cabs and Zinfandel act pretty neutral when it comes to new oak. They kind of show the oak off a little bit more. Um, where other varietals can really throw you, you know, just, just go 180 degrees in their direction. 
So by tasting it with a cab, I can tell, well, you know, this was kind of a lower impact. And when I taste that cab in that barrel against another new barrel that I know how that barrel and that cab reacts with it, I can kind of judge that. It's more of a gut feeling for me when I taste them and smell them. If there's a spice component coming out that I really like going, oh, that would work really well in a Sangiovese or God, that would be killer in Merlot or I need this barrel for my Syrah. And that's the reason why, because of those different spices it promotes and the different flavors you get. Uh, Chris would like to know, uh, he thanks you for the information on the bungs, and is there any concern about oxygen getting in through the bung during fermentation or barrel aging? No, well the firm bung, the way it's designed is kind of springy, so it just, it pops open when it's releasing gas, which is CO2, and then it just seals right back up. During fermentation, you actually want oxygen because yeast wants some oxygen in there. So that's why when we do barrel fermentation, we'll um, actually, um, <coughs> pardon me, we'll uh, let the wine start in a tank first just for just until it gets going so we make sure it's got plenty of air, um, oxygen in there, and then we put it at the barrel. So it's still getting that oxygen. Now, inside uh, the barrel, as it's aging, yes, we want to manage how much oxygen it gets. That's why the bungs are, they seal down, and that's why the staves, like, you know, we talked about the staves, how the oxygen actually will penetrate through the stave into the wine. That's called micro-oxygenation. But that's also the same reason why once a wine stave gets, or barrel gets old, you don't want to use it anymore, because what happens is, is these pores all get clogged. Okay, so, and that means no oxygen is being transferred. So you want oxygen to transfer through to the wine, but you need to manage it and you want it to be at a certain level because that's what helps. Remember from before we talked about how tannins bind with oxygenation. Oxygen is part of the aging process for wine. So that's what makes them more drinkable, more accessible, and that's just part of the aging process. While on the topic of oxygen, uh, you said that it's important at some stages in fermentation uh, at what specific times is oxygen an important thing? I know you do oxygenate the wine. Actually. We do it early on. So the yeast like lots of O2. So like, they like lots of oxygen. So what we'll do is in the beginning portions of fermentations, we'll do what's called a splash, where we actually splash it through a screen so it actually gets more air and oxygenates and puts it back over. So we'll do that probably right up until... Um, it starts to get below that um, about the time we start slowing down the fermentation. So at the same time, we were going to start watching. Remember, we talked about how extracting tannins from the seeds, we start slowing down because alcohol is building. That's about the same time we start slowing down the oxygenation of the, of the must. It still gets that uh, by doing a pump over on it, but not at the same level. And then um, once it's done with primary fermentation, when the yeast are done doing their job, and we press it off, then we start limiting how much oxygen the wine gets at that point in time. Um, we still will do racks for, on the red wines especially, we'll do a lot of rackings um, early on with no gas coverage, uh, so they get as much oxygen as possible. Uh, but again, we can control that. And then once, basically after, usually after January 1st, we use uh, inert gas coverage on everything. So we make sure that we can, can that's no more oxygen is going in unless we want it to go in. So um, all depends on, and it depends on the varietals. White wines, we, white wines and Pinot, we protect a lot more. Uh, we don't, you know, white wines, you just want to oxygenate the juice early on a little bit, and then that's it. And then we want to protect it from oxygen because they're more susceptible, right? They don't have that same tannin structure of a red wine. They're more susceptible to being over oxygenated. So we have to be careful about that. Carolyn would like to know what are the uh, handwritten numbers that are just the barrel numbers. That's how we track them. There's actually a barrel tag down below um, that says what the barrel is, and it's a tracking system in our computers. So that number is assigned to that individual barrel, so we can track that barrel, what's been in it, uh, how many uh, days it's been empty, how many days it's been full, what wines have been in and out of that barrel its entire life here. How do you come up with the number? Is it a running number? It's a, right, it's a non-intelligent barcode is what it's called. So the first two numbers are the vintage. So the 13 you saw was the 2013 barrel. And then it's just a running number set after that. Some places use intelligent numbers. So the first two numbers are the vintage. Next two numbers are maybe the Cooper. The next two numbers are maybe the Forest. And so on and so on. We like to keep things simple. I got the, the, 
the best question here right now is Jen wants to know if you got a haircut. Yes. Okay. I did. A legal haircut. Not in a back alley either. Because some people are aren't sure it's you. They think yeah. it's your evil twin. Yeah. Well, that's well, easy okay, enough. Nice twin. Yeah, nice. I would say nice twin. Yeah. <laughs> evil twin was last. All the other episodes. Okay, sorry. I'll shut up. That's right. And Bev said I spelled it correctly. I'm you happy. You got it right. Good yeah. So. Uh, last week, you mentioned being concerned about rain. Uh, at this point in the process, uh, Len said we only got about a quarter inch. Were our touch would have been too much. Uh, and does that change at different points in the process? Well, this is the most vulnerable point for us for rain prior to harvest, right? It's, it's, it's bloom. So a light rain's not going to hurt us. It's, um, and it's not how many inches you get, it's the veracity. We could have got a quarter of an inch, but if we got a quarter of an inch in two minutes, like a torrential downpour thunderstorm, that, that's what's the raindrops coming down. A light mist, like an inch, I think over eight hours or something like that. So that didn't, that's really not going to hurt us. It was more about mold and mildew pressure. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, as far as the bloom aspect, that wasn't a problem. The heavy winds that we were getting with that, um, and that kind of, uh, that is a little concerning sometimes. But um, right now, like Len just showed you a picture. I think he took that just a couple days ago, of the Syrah. So it's still blooming. Excuse me. And uh, so that's a concern if we get a storm now, which we don't have any in the forecast. Um, we're getting these weird heat spikes like, Today it's 96 degrees. It was 100 degrees yesterday. Tomorrow it's supposed to be what, 80, 80 78 80. degrees. Yeah, yeah. So we're just going up and down and up and down. That actually is not the best thing ever. Um, we'd like it to be a little more consistent. That's a little bit better for the grapevines because that's kind of like, like I said, grapevines like the same temperature we do. So when you start doing all those variations, it's like, you know, what the hey, you know, come on. Does so. that heat uh, change cause those caps on the flowers to stick? Is that what the problem is? Uh, no, it's just the vines are trying to grow consistently. And so once they get, you know, once you start getting over about 95 degrees, they shut down, they're done. They don't want to go anymore. It's just, you got to think about when you're out working in your garden, you know, when it starts getting over 90 degrees, you're like, I'm done. You know, it's too hot. I'm going to start shutting down. Well, the vines start shutting down. We don't want that. We want the vines to keep moving right now and keep that vigor going because we want to get that, get that fruit developed. So. Jen would like to know if Brunello is from a certain region. Yes. Next. No, I'm just kidding. It is in the Tuscany region. And David, what region was that? Uh, Montalcino. Montalcino. The town of Montalcino. So that's Brunello de Montalcino. That David is our Brunello expert. He won't share him, but he is our expert. No, I'm just kidding. John and Cindy would like to know how to distinguish between the evil twin and the devilish humor. You must ask my wife. Uh, you can't, so you can't call this a Chianti because it's not from that region. No, that's right. Because Chianti is a DOCG. It is a, um, a consortium like Coro, and it has to be from that area, and you have to follow their rules. So, yeah, it cannot be. But in Chianti, Chianti can do different stuff. Like a Super Tuscan, the way a Super Tuscan was developed was Antonori, who was one of the largest wine producers and largest vineyard owners in Tuscany, wanted to add cab to his wine, and they wouldn't allow it. And they said, no, you can't do that. That's against all the rules. So basically he said, screw you. I'm going to start my own rules. And that's where Tagnianello came from was from the Antonori family saying, we're going to make a wine that we want to make, and we're going to call it a Super Tuscan, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so it stuck. Uh, what is your favorite varietal to grow and why? My favorite varietal to grow? That's a really good question. Lenny answered. Did he? Lenny, Len answered Sangiovese because he uh. drank it. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you, probably. If I had my own, if I was growing my own grapes for me to drink, it would be Sangiovese, Chenin Blanc, probably, for a white, Chardonnay for my wife, because I don't get, you know, kicked out of the house, and then uh, Sauvignon Blanc. But, uh, yeah, 
Sh a good Chenin Blanc. I just, I've always loved Chenin Blanc. It's just so underrated. But, uh, yeah, it's a fun wine. I love Chenin Blanc, too. And I, what I just heard, Stephen, was he wants us to plant Chenin Blanc, and he wants to make another varietal. I mm -hmm. think so, and, and maybe even <laughs> Pinot Grigio. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard that's a great money maker. I yes. think we should buy. I think we should. Uh, I think we should do that. Money yeah, <laughs> I hear. Yeah, everybody at Lantern is going. Yes, make Pinot Grigio. Yeah, I know. Everybody on the East Coast wants a Pinot Grigio. Uh, Carolyn has a great. Oh, no. You want to read Carolyn's question? I'm not sure if I'm there yet. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Well, What's no, Carolyn's I, question? I think Kevin should probably read it. Uh, it was Carolyn. Okay. You want me to read it? Well, go for okay. it. Okay. Carolyn asked a great question. Will Brutico ever make a Brunello style wine? Yeah, it's right here. Super premium, yummy. It's 100% Sangiovese. Hey, it's Brunello that you can afford. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. If we make what we think is plausible, how's that? Um, we have young vineyards. We don't have a Sangiovese vineyard that's 40 years old on a mountainside, um, you know, so it's, but I think that we could make a, uh, we're gonna be there at a higher quality. The, um, this wine is Hopland Ranches, so it's Felice where I showed you the vineyard in the video, but it's also 30% of a very young vineyard here on the Bliss Ranch, which is actually Brunello clones. Um, so hopefully when, this, when these little guys down here grow up in Bliss, they still have another 30 years to go, we will be there. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's coming. It's coming. Uh, Haas, since we're talking about Brunello and Chianti and all of these different wines, can you go over, just to make sure everyone knows, what, what is a Brunello, what is a Chianti? Well, Brunello is 100% Sangiovese grown in a certain area. That's a Brunello, right? So a Chianti is a, actually a blend. I don't know all the different bridles they can use, but there is a set section what they do. They have to do, there's certain techniques they have to use to be a Chianti, but I think they released that. And I think it's Chianti Classical only now that has the certain parameters because they used to have to add back some fruit and some weird things, but That's not anymore. percent Sangiovese, and then the other 20 is from a list of varietals. A list of varietals, similar to what Coro does, yeah. So it's, that's what they're doing. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's more of a blend, but it's, and I think they actually did add cab to that finally because the Super Tuscans took off, but there's only a certain amount of uh, play that they actually have. Uh, but I mean, as long as they follow the rules, it's called Chianti, Chianti Classico. So, and again, it's a certain region in Tuscany. And the Super Tuscans have to be 70% Sangiovese. Yeah, they finally made some rules on that, but they're allowed a little bit more leeway on what varietals that they can use. And they finally kind of adapted, you know, because Tagnanello went so ballistic worldwide and got such rave reviews that the uh, Italian uh, government said, okay. <laughs> uh, what do you do with the barrels when they get too old to use? I have a garden planted in mine. Tomatoes, zucchini, basil, um, a lot of barrels. Some barrels we sell to other wineries, uh, but most of the time, by the time we get done with our barrels, they pretty much go to planters. We sell them actually to um, nurseries and a couple of hardware stores, and then um, our employees take them home and use them for planters. The Arkansas Crew has a great question on how do you control the temperature during barrel fermentation? You, uh, that's air temperature. So basically, it's just trying to keep your cellar at a certain temperature. You know, the wine's going to spike. It's going to come up to 70 degrees, 75 degrees. But we try to keep the cellar as cool as possible to help keep, minimize that. Uh, but that's part of what the, the barrel's a great insulator with that oak. And it kind of helps also. But you want that little bit warmer fermentation for those barrel fermented flavors. Linda has a question for the family. Do you make any vegetarian-friendly risotto, or do they all have chicken broth in them, asking for a friend? I think it's possible. Yeah. And there's your answer. Yeah. We, we actually answered it online. Did you? Yeah. yeah. We do. Anything's possible. Well, Look sure, it. like a saffron and roasted red bell pepper. Your dad just said uh, he made it with uh, wild mushrooms. He made isotto. <laughs> Isotto. 
Um, how many tasting samples are taken out of each barrel, and how frequently? Um, well, when we do our big tasting in December and January, we take a single sample out of each of the brand new barrels that we had the wine in for the past year. But usually it's, uh, we check different barrels during the year. We'll go in, so if there is, um, like the Sangiovese, there was probably about uh, 45 barrels in uh, one lot, and another lot might have been 10, another lot might have been, you know, 13 or something like that. So from each lot, we'll, we'll pick from maybe like the 50-barrel lot or 45-barrel lot, maybe pull a sample out of two or three barrels. Um, that's done once every two months uh, to check the sulfur levels to make sure everything's going okay. We'll taste them real quick. Um, we go through and taste. Oh, uh, Every three months, we usually taste every wine at least once by going through and checking them, make sure they're all good. But we don't taste each individual barrel every time. We only taste uh, the individual barrels once a year. Uh, Robert would like to know how the barrels from World Cooperage are used. Uh, what variety? They use, they're on, the only wines that don't touch World Cooperage barrels are Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, and Pinot. That's it. And of course, Rosé, but... But all, they, they're across all of our other red wines. They, we use them on everything. In fact, it was an actual mistake one time, one year, when they filled an American oak barrel, that T.W. Boswell Reserve barrel, um, with Barbera. And we said, well, let's just let it roll and see what it did. And it was excellent. And it was a perfect, you know, a cellar blend sometimes is what some of the best wines come from. So that's what actually, that's how that we started using American oak on the Italians because it did so well with that Barbera. Uh, Brian would like to know who decides whether a new label is desired for a particular varietal. It's kind of a, I don't know, I'd say it's pretty much a group decision. You had your production meeting yesterday. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's between all of us kind of kick it around and just see if we think it's something better or not and just go from there. Someone wanted to know what color your shirt was. It's peach. And so now, okay, now that's a shirt, right, everybody? <laughs> yes? I mean, his shirt last week was good, but come on. We're six feet away. Don't worry. Hi, everybody. All these other people don't want to get on the screen, but, here, you know, come on, Kevin, Karen, David, get on the screen. Get some screen time. Anyway, thank you all for being part of this. This has been really fun. I've been in Arizona for ten weeks. I finally got to see family and family and family and friends. So it's great to be here, but thank you all for being part of this. So anyway, enjoy the shirt. Haas will do a little better next week. He just had to go change his shirt. It's just, okay, whatever. I didn't want you to know what was coming. Oh, yeah, I, I looked worried. I looked worried. <laughs> oh. Someone's wondering about penny shipping uh, on barrels of wine. Or, no, sorry, empty, empty barrels. barrels. <laughs> Planner boxes. Uh, well, penny ship uh, kit you have to put together. How's that? <laughs> we can ship it to the curb. They come pick it up. They sell them at Walmart in that area. Hey, there's a question right there. Uh, how often do Haas and Len walk the vineyards together, socially distanced, to bounce ideas or impressions between them? <sighs> probably not as much. Harvest time, we probably walk a lot more looking at stuff. But a lot of times, because of our schedules, it's not, it's, it's like, I'll go walk something, or Len will go, he goes, hey, take a look at that, or I'll say, hey, go take a look at this. Because, you know, 350 acres, it's kind of hard to do that. And if there's something that we feel is really important, then we get together and we meet and we go look at that one area. Um, but we talk a lot about, you know, hey, I saw this, I saw that, this is what, what we're doing. So, and we talk a lot more starting like kind of, you know, the springtime now that we got all this growth and what we're seeing and moving forward. And then, um, and then we have, we have wrap up meetings every year after harvest, trying to figure out what went right, what we need to do to improve some something, you know, uh, what we can do at the winery to help improve something and back and forth so um you know it's it's all the time but as far as actually walking side by side down the vineyard 
not as much as you'd think because we're both pretty busy. <laughs> okay, I got one. First of all, thank you all for the great compliments on my shirt. I appreciate it, but we have an anniversary coming up. Ken, uh, Ken. Kevin and Karen, one year next Monday. Woohoo! One year. Yay! Woohoo! Hello, Arkansas. Love you guys. God, it's been a year already. It's been a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it feels like an eternity. What does that say? Karen's like, oh, yeah. Especially the last couple months. Really wild. You should get in there. Pandemic time. Anyway. We're going to shelter in place on Monday. There you go. Kevin's good good move. Where uh, where is your county at in regards to businesses opening? And they're wondering about the barbecue in August. I'll be honest with you. We just don't know. Um, At this point in time, we're just not sure right now probably everything is there's not going to be any big events like that happening until probably after the first of the year uh the way we're seeing the phasing coming through in california we're hoping to get our tasting room open at least but um here maybe the next two or three weeks but as far as large events um even uh until we hit phase four which means that the the threat of the virus is completely gone they will not allow us to have that many people in one area and we're not getting political <laughs> uh, I think we are someone seconds a uh, Chenin Blanc and Pinot Grigio and Pinot Grigio there's always that Pinot Grigio person thanks Linda uh, <laughs> Is the rootstock for the Sangiovese? Um, that's a Len question. Is that 10114 Len? I think out there, if I remember right. Uh, that's a pretty common rootstock that we use in a lot of our vineyards because it works so well. Um, I'm not sure if that's on the Felice. I'm pretty sure that's what we have in Bliss, but Len will probably pop up here and, and give us an answer. But so the rootstocks depend, the rootstock really depends on your soils, your weather patterns, and, and what you're growing on top of it. So, and we have the, we have like two or three that work really well. Plus there's different rootstocks that are disease resistant for certain things. Um, so that's, you use those for certain areas. Um, some, you know, so it all depends. What have we ever used any barrels Minnesota. from a Minnesota from Minnesota? Yes, we have. I've used Minnesota American Oak um, for the last two or three years. Uh, well, haven't used it for about two or three years. But yeah, we did have uh, from Radu. We got some oak from Minnesota. We really liked it on our old Zin, our old vine Zin. It was great. But since we got we had to tear out our old vine Zin, we don't use it anymore. So since 2015, we haven't used any Minnesota oak. Uh, we use it's Appalachia oak is where our mainly Missouri is where most of our American oak comes from. So, uh, uh, Kevin asked how many. Kevin Schmidt asked how many barrels do you buy a year? Um, about two hundred, about two hundred barrels a What's year. What's the mix, French to American? Uh, that's a good. It's about fifty-fifty. Mainly, it's it's yeah, it's about fifty-fifty. And but if you're talking about price. 90% French is where our budget goes. Yep. I'll be honest with you. It's, they're that much more expensive than American. Um, John and Cindy would like to know about Steve's shirt. Is that the standard issue from Yuma? This is actually from Hawaii, but thank you. And Brian says, awesome shirt, yeah. Steve, shirt yeah. wear. And Dan says, free bowl of soup. Oh, my God. <laughs> really? <laughs> Who's this Dan guy? Who's, who's Dan? Does anyone know who Dan is? You know, the funny thing is, is this shirt is actually from Maui. You, anyway. You've got some nice shirts. Yeah, yeah it's whatever. Well, I, you know, I was going to wear my Santa Maui shirt, but, you know, I figured I'd wait. Uh, Andy would like to know what is Steve's golf index these days? Wow, that's a great question. Going up. Going up. Oh, there's a, there's a good question. This is the one from Luke? No. What yeah. about the blending? Yeah. What's the lowest amount you would put in a blend? Like Chianti is at least 80% Sangiovese, 
Is there any point in mixing in 10% of a different wine when one varietal is is the other 90 to 95%? I think, you understand that? Yeah, so it depends on what varietal you're using and what you're doing, but I can tell you right now, um, in the 2018s that we've been putting, uh, we're getting ready to bottle, I've used as little as a half a percent of Syrah. And so it just depends on what you're looking for. And it doesn't take a lot sometimes. It, you know, 1% to a half a percent of some varietals or of just what the one profile changes everything in, in that wine. It might be just enough acid or just enough pH shift to where you really explode the flavors you're looking for or just fills in that little hole. It only takes a little bit. So, uh, yeah, as, as little as a half a percent. Happy anniversary There's a lot to of you. Yes. Yes. Karen wants to get in on camera. I think Karen should get on camera. Lenny says 101.14. Come on. Come on, Come on up. Socially distanced. No, no. You're like you two don't have to. That's all right. But you know what we're going to do? See, I can slide over this way like this. <laughs> get there. It's going to be like the high school dance. We're going to put the put the tape measure between them. Here they come. Okay, now now what remember this from the wedding? What are you supposed to do? We didn't do that. Oh, we'll do it. You don't remember that? You are not going to kiss her for God's sake on camera? Yeah. No, okay, you don't have to. Come on, give her a kiss. He's blessing. Yay! <laughs> All right. Hi everyone. All right. Cool. All right, it's the dating game. All right, who's next? Um, well, I'm not kissing Steve. I hate to tell you. Oh. <laughs> There's a question well, uh, about the three-liter bottle in the in the video. I think. Um, when I talked about the three. Was that barrel selected for that bottling, or was it just a random barrel that was held back for that? Well, we blended the whole. We blended the quadriga, made the whole quadriga blend, and we barreled it back down to hold it to bottle it in three liters um, later on. So. That was last year, so now we're going to get it. We'll, we'll bottle it up this year. Have you ever used a whiskey barrel? Lots of wineries are now promoting the idea. Uh, in the early days of winemaking, yes, we did. We used a lot of Jack Daniel barrels. So it used to be funny because Fetzer would get a train car load of uh, Jack Daniels barrels, and the guys would go and load them, and they'd drain them. Because from the train car ride from Tennessee to here, they'd sweat out uh, raw Jack Daniels. So out of a train car load, they'd end up with 10 gallons of whiskey uh, that had not been charcoal filtered and had not been cut with water yet. So uh, yeah, it was some pretty potent stuff. That was, um, those are some fun days at the Big Dog. Anyway, so yes, we have in the past, there wasn't, they weren't coopered that way. This is back in the early 80s, late 70s. So that's where you got your American Oak barrels was used bourbon barrels. Now it's a whole sensation, big thing, so. We're caught up in questions right now. What's, if we keep asking questions, Haas will go through okay. the whole bottle. You, do you ever have no, I already did, barrels. it's empty. What's that? Uh, do you ever run out of barrels um, and what, I mean, what would you do with the wine if you ran out of barrels? Oh, we do all, all the time. Well, you got to put it in tank and you got to figure out other, you know, that's why you have this method. That's why we do all the bliss wines with, uh, with oak alternatives. There are, there's different varying degrees of oak alternatives uh, that you can buy. And some are like very expensive, high end uh, that if we needed to, we can use um, to help influence the, the Brutica wine. We don't really do that. Um, we have what, uh, and you guys see in the videos, you see our flex tanks, those plastic tanks. They're actually breathable tanks made for vinification, made for wine. They breathe just like a barrel. So we can actually add oak to that um, if we needed to. But, uh, but most of the, we have enough cooperage to handle all our Brutica wine. Um, what? The Mount Bethel. So the Arkansas crew is, uh, wants to tell everyone about their... Um, their winery in Arkansas, they used to use uh, the whiskey barrels in the 70s uh, from Jim Beam. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael and Eugene drained the extra whiskey out of the barrels and gave it to the winos. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that, worked, that was what we did in Hoplin. 
We are just, we were all winos at that point in time. Well, there's another question. It's a great question. Uh, are we going to have the kiss cam every week? And so I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping Karen shows up because I don't want you three to kiss yeah. each other. I think, I think Kevin's the one you have to worry about. I think so. <sighs> the kiss cam. Well, That's funny. I, I like what Bev just said. Yeah, so um, Bev That's a great idea. suggested, and it's a great idea, uh, can we have a few minutes at one of the tips to actually meet everyone who's online and join in a toast? And so um, we can try to, if anyone wants to be on camera, I'm not sure if you can turn your cameras on, we can all... We can do it right now. Toast. We can do it right now. How do we... I'm not sure if you can turn them on, can awesome. you? Awesome. Let's find out. Oh, they're not seeing it. There's Tim McBride, Andy Dreyer, Len Brutico. Oh, wait, Len, come here. How do you turn it on? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Oh, look, John's hiding. John, you're hiding Jameson, aren't you? I can tell. There we go. <laughs> it's a start video. Where? I don't know. Take Steve off. <laughs> Wait, I'll, I'll, I'll show my shirt. This is fun. This is Look awesome. There, Chris, I like it. Oh, happy anniversary. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. Who did that? Oh, that's yours. This is mine. Oh, come on. Oh, there's the Arkansas crew. Woohoo! Oh. Wait a minute. Elky. Spokane oh, crew. Woo. Is that a fake video with Elky? Yeah. It is. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> it's like the ocean. <laughs> Look at the Arkansas crew. Wow. That's my girl drinking rosé. There's, there's Bev. Hi, Bev. Come on. Come on. Oh, there they are. Perfect. Wow. Look at that Arkansas crew. Wow. I don't know if that's social. Hey, y'all. How are we all doing? Hey, Irv. Let's get drunk. Hey. <laughs> oh, hey, everybody. Salute. 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 Here's the kid in the At least there's something left in it. Now we're all can you hear us? Hey, Karen. Hey, Karen. Hi. We're only on our fourth bottle of San Jose. Maybe we should. No, sorry. Hey, Kevin. We expect nothing less. Kevin, Don Nelson. Hey, Don. How's, how's your fruit trees? Very good. Cool. <laughs> We're leaving tomorrow to bring you your, your wedding cake. Yeah, we're gonna leave tomorrow to bring you your tumbler, your wedding cake. Oh, we know, we recognize that voice. <laughs> is you, you guys are kidding, right? No, no, no. 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 I'm not kidding. Tomorrow. 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 Really? <laughs> I'd like to tell you with that oh, Arkansas like crew. This movie is. <laughs> you won't tell the leave. Yeah. <laughs> It's your family, not mine. I mean, you tell me. Oh, there's more people. For everyone who's wondering, so we got married a year ago in Arkansas. We went in Arkansas on the cake. And that our, the top of our cake that you're supposed to eat at your one year anniversary in my mom's freezer. I say oh. grandma freezer, Karen. That's a problem. It's a problem. It's a problem. It's a problem. It's a problem. Well, the virus gets its away. So, coronavirus. Arkansas. Did you ship it? We'll see what you got to do. You ship it somewhere? <laughs> you just eat it. Like a week when you get back from your honeymoon, Indeed. instead of freezing it so it tastes like crap, you eat it. So then you can eat it, eat it on your first <laughs> anniversary or baptism of your first child. You have to oh, fed it. Oh. Did you hear that? You know, all these people need to make it sure. first child on your anniversary is what I heard. Hey, Steve, are we still good for our dice game tonight? What? <laughs> what dice game? Who are you? I don't know you. Are we still good for the dice game tonight? 
one. We're on, buddy. Hey, I'm going to do a shout out to my college buddies, Tim McBride, Andy Dreyer, Robert Selig, Brian Flynn. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for being here. And I see Leslie Brudico down in the corner. Hi, Leslie. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Uh, free house in Jim, like the house. house. <laughs> it's good to see Steve working. <laughs> really? <laughs> Show me a picture, would you? <laughs> about, about four shows ago, you said, my job is to go and check the cars to make sure no one's sleeping. That was what you said I do. So let's... Continue. I said that? You said that. We have it on film. Do we? We have it on tape. I don't remember saying yeah. that. I don't remember yeah. that either. And I'm good at it. We'll have to go back and rewatch it. I'm, I'm good at They're it. They're all on YouTube. I, I did it today. No one was sleeping. I didn't bark like hey, hey, Hoss, for the, for the record, we heard it and we have not forgotten. We brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Wow. Much fun. Hey, Lenny's at the beach too. By the ropes. Yeah. Nice. Captain. Yeah. Cool off a little bit. Yeah. You can bring it right there. So. Oh, stuck in the background. Oh, is that? Oh, yeah. Wait. Hi, Alex. Hi, Alex. There's Alex. Hey, Alex. Hey, the Amy's. Whoa, that's a lot of feedback coming through. All right. All right. Cool. America's Most Wanted on one screen. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gang. What? Oh, there's Shirley in the background. Hey, Mom. <laughs> That's the All right, gang. Well, guess what? Well, thank you all so much for joining us. This has been a, a great time tonight with San Giovese. You've seen everybody's faces finally. Um, again, remember, as always, the only difference between a wine connoisseur and a wino, one takes a brown paper bag off. Thank you so much. Salute. Ching, ching. Goodbye. Cheers. Honey, I'm coming home.